Hello, everyone. We are in chapter 13 of Where the Red Fern Grows. Um, yesterday, we just finished up chapter 12. Billy is on a coon hunt with the Pritchard boys for a bet. We don't quite know yet if he is going to catch this coon, but it is, a, it is the infamous ghost coon that he's heard so much from the Pritchard boys. And so chapter 12 did, uh, left off with us um, wondering if he's gonna catch the coon. Um, so we are gonna jump into chapter tw uh, 13 today and see what happens with this uh, bet. All right, so here we go. Chapter 13 of Where the Red Fern Grows. Coming up to the tree, I could see it was a huge burr oak. It wasn't tall, it was just the opposite, rather low and squatty. The top was a thick mass of large limb and it had shed all of its leaves yet. It hadn't shed all of its leaves yet. It stood by itself in the old field. There were no other trees within 50 yards of it. About 15 feet to the left, there were the remains of a barbed wire fence. An old gate hung by old rusty hinges from the large corner post. I could tell that this one, that this time, I could tell that at one time, a house stood close by. Reuben saw, me one, we, Reuben saw me looking around. A long time ago, some Indians lived here and, and farmed these fields, he said. I walked through, <clears throat> I walked around the tree looking for the coon, but could see very little in the dark shadows. Randy spoke up. It ain't the first time we've been up to this tree, he said. Reuben told Randy to shut up. You talk too much, he said. In a whining voice, Randy said, Reuben, you would know the coon ain't in that tree. Make him pay off and let's go home. I'm getting tired. I told Reuben I was going to climb the tree. Go ahead, he said. I want you, I, I won't, it won't do you any good. The tree was easy to climb. I looked all over it in each limb in the very, in, and in, the, in every dark space, place. I looked for a hollow. I looked for a hollow. The ghost coon wasn't there. I climbed back down, scolded old Dan to stop his loud bawling and, look at, and, and looked at little Ann. I saw her far up the old fence uh, row, sniffing and running here and there. I knew the ghost hoon had pulled a real trick, but I couldn't figure out what it was. Little Ann had never yet barked tree. I knew if the coon was in the tree, she wouldn't, she wouldn't still be searching for a tail. Old Dan started working again. My dogs covered the field. They circled and circled. They ran up and down the barbed wire fence on both sides. I knew the coon hadn't walked the barbed fire, ghost or no ghost, he couldn't do that. I walked over the old gate and looked around. I sat down and stared up in the tree. Little Ann came to me. Old Dan, giving up his search, came to me, came to the tree and bawled a couple of times. I scolded him again. Reuben came over, leering at, leering at me. He said, you give up? I didn't answer. Little Ann once again started searching for the old trail uh, old Dan uh, went to help her. Randy said, I told you that you couldn't, that, that you couldn't tree the ghost coon. Why don't you pay off so we can go home? I told him I hadn't given up. My dogs were still hunting. When they give up, I would too. Reuben said, well, we're not going to stay here all night. Looking back at the tree, I thought perhaps I overlooked something. I told Reuben I was going to climb it again. He laughed, go ahead, won't do any good. You climbed it once, ain't you satisfied? No, I'm not satisfied, I said. I just don't, I just don't believe in ghost coon. Reuben said, I don't believe in ghost coon either, but the facts are facts. Tell you the truth, I've climbed that tree a dozen times and there just ain't no place in, in it for a coon to hide. Randy spoke up. Or old blue hound had tree the ghost coon in, that, in this tree more times than, than one. Maybe you two don't believe in ghosts, but I do. Why don't you pay off so we can go, so we can get away from here? I'll, I'll climb it one more time, I said. If I can't find it, find him, I'll pay off. Climbing up again, I searched and searched. I went through, I, I, when I got through, I knew the ghost coon wasn't in the tree. When I got down, I saw my dogs had given up. That, look, that took the last resistance out of me. I knew if I couldn't find the ghost coon, I couldn't. If they couldn't find the ghost coon, I couldn't. Digging the, uh, digging, the two, uh, digging the two dollar bills out of my pocket, I walked over to Reuben. Little Ann was, was by my side. I handed over the money saying, well, you want it fair and square. 
With a grin on his face, Reuben took my money. He said, I bet this will break your old grandpa's heart. I didn't reply. Reaching down, I caught little Anne's head in my hand, looking, looking into her warm, uh, friendly eyes. I said, it's all right, little girl. We haven't given up yet. We'll come back. We may never catch the ghost coon, but we'll run him until his leaves, he leaves the country. She licked my hand and whined. A small breeze began to stir. Glancing up into the tree, I, I saw some leaves shaking. I said to Reuben, look, look, looks like the wind is coming up. It may blow up the storm. We better be heading for, for home. Just as I turned, I saw little Anne throw up her head and whine. Her body grew stiff and taut. I watched her. She was testing the wind. I knew she had scented something in the breeze. Stiff-legged, high head in the air, she started walking toward the tree. Almost there, she turned back and stopped. I knew she had caught the scent, but, only, but could only catch it when the breeze came. Looking at Reuben, I said, I haven't lost that $2 yet. Another breeze drifted out of the river bottoms. Little Ann caught the scent again. Slowly, she walked straight into the large gate post reared up on it with her with her front feet and bawled the most beautiful tree bark I had ever heard in my life. Old Dan, not understanding why little Ann was, was bawling, stood up, stood and looked. He walked over to the to the post, reared up on it and sniffed. Then raising his head, he shook the dead leaves in the uh, in the burr bark tree in his deep voice. I looked at Ranny, laughing, I said, there's your ghost coon. Now, what do you think of my dogs? For, for once, he had no reply. Going over to the post, I, I saw it was a large black locust put there many years ago to hang in the gate. Looking up to the tree, I saw how the ghost coon had pulled his trick. One large long limb ran out, hung directly over the gate. It was dropped. It was a drop of a good 12 feet from the branch and the top of the gate post. But I knew there wasn't it after there weren't but I knew we weren't after an ordinary coon. This was the ghost coon. I said to Reuben, boost me up and I'll see if, if, I, if the post is hollow. After breaking off a long jimson weed, we used it as a prod. I, I got up on Reuben's shoulders. <clears throat> he raised me up. The post was hollow. Not knowing how far down the hole went, I started, I started to switch down. About halfway, I felt something soft. It ga I gave it a jab. I heard him coming. His boil, he boiled out right in my face. I let go of everything hitting the ground. I rolled over to my back and looked up. For a split second, the ghost coon stayed on top of the post and, he, and then he jumped on me. My dogs were on him in, in an instant he hit the ground. The fight was on. I knew the coon didn't have a chance as he wasn't in the water or the river. He didn't give up easily even though he was on dry land. He was fighting for his life and a good and a good account he gave. He fought his way to freedom. He made his way back to the burbark tree. He was a good six feet, six feet up the side when old Dan, leaping high in the air, caught him and pulled him back down. At the front of the tree, the fight went on. Again, the ghost coon fought for his, for his free. This time he made it and disappeared in the dark shadow of the tree. Old Dan was furious. Never before I had seen a coon get away from him. I told Reuben I would climb up and run him out. As I started climbing, I saw little Ann go on one side and old Dan on the other side. Uh, my dogs would never stay together when they had treated a coon. So that anyway, he left it. So that anyway, he left the coon, the tree. He was met by one of them. About halfway up far on the limb, I found the ghost coon. I started towards him. My dog stopped bawling. I heard something I had heard many times. The sound was a cry of a small baby. It was the cry of a, of a, of a ringtail coon when he knew it was the end of the trail. I never liked to hear this cry, but it was one, it was, but it was all in the game, a hunter and the hunted. As I sat on the limb looking at the old fellow, he cried again. Something came over me. I didn't want to kill him. I hollered down to Reuben. I didn't want to kill. I don't. I didn't want to kill the ghost coon. He hollered back, "Are you crazy?" I told him I wasn't crazy. I just didn't want to kill him. I climbed down. Reuben was mad. He said, "What's the matter with you?" Nothing. I told him. I just don't want to have the heart to kill the coon. I told him there were plenty more. Why kill him? 
He had lived here a long time, and more than, than one hunter had listened to the voice of the, of the hound bawling, bawling on his trail, Granny said. He's chicken livered. That's what he is. And uh, I didn't like that, but not wanting to argue, I didn't say anything. Ruben said, I'll go up and run him out. I won't let my dogs, I won't let my dogs kill him, I said. Ruben glared at me. I'm going up and, uh, and run that coon out, he said. If you, stop, if you stop your dogs, I'm going to beat you half to death. Do it anyways, Reuben, Ranny said. I have, a good, I have a good mind too, said Reuben. Just as Reuben started to climb the tree, old Dan growled. He was, he was staring into the darkness. Something was coming. What it, what's that, I asked. I don't know, Reuben said. Don't sound like anything I've ever heard. It's ghost, Ranny said. Let's get away from here. An animal was coming out of the darkness. It was walking slowly in an odd way, as if, as if it were walking sideways. The hair on my back of the neck stood out straight. As the animal came closer, Granny said, why, it's old blue, how'd he get loose? It was a big blue tick hound. Around his neck was a piece of rope about three feet. One, one could see the rope had been gnawed into. The frayer end uh, had become entangled in his fair-sized dead limb, in a, in a fair-sized dead limb. Dragging the limb was what made the, dark, the dog look so odd. I felt so much better when I found out what it was. The blue tick hound was like the preacher's mean, well, was like the pre preacher's mean and ugly. He was a big dog, tall, heavy. His chest was thick and solid. He came up growling. The hair on the back was standing up straight. He walked stiff leg around old Dan, showing his teeth. I told Granny he better get a, get a hold of his dogs or there was sure to be a fight. You better get a hold of your dogs, he said. I'm, I'm not worried about old, Dan, old Blue. He could take care of himself. I said no more. Don't make no difference how whether you kill the ghost coon or not, Reuben said. Old Blue will take care of him. I knew the killing of the coon was out of my control, but I didn't want to see him die. I said to Reuben, just give me back my two dollars and I'll go home. I can't keep you from killing him, but I don't have to stay here and see it. Reuben, Reuben, don't give him and his money, Randy said. He ain't killed the ghost coon. That's right, Reuben said. You ain't. And I won't let you now, even if you wanted to. I told them my dogs had treed the coon, and that was the bet. And the tree, and the tree to tree the ghost coon. Now, uh, no, it wasn't, Reuben said. You said you would kill him. It was no such thing, I said. I've done all I said I would. Reuben walked up in the uh, walked up in front of me. He said, "I ain't going to give you your money. You ain't. You didn't win it fair. Now, what are you going to do about it?" I looked into his mean eyes. I started to make some reply, but decided against it. He saw my hesitation and said, "You better get your dogs and get out of here before you get whipped." In a loud voice, Randy said, "Bloody his nose, Reuben." I was scared. I couldn't whip Reuben. He was too big for me. I started to turn and leave when I thought of what my grandfather had told them. You had better remember what my grandpa said, I reminded them. He'll just do, he'll ju he'll do just what he said he would. Reuben didn't hit me. He just grabbed me and with and grabbed me with his brute strength, threw me down on the ground. He had me on my back with my arms spread out. He had my knee. He had a knee in each arm. I made no effort to fight back. I was scared. If you say one word to your grandpa about this, Reuben said, I'll catch you hunting some night and take my knife to you. Reuben looked up, uh, looking up into the, his ugly face. I knew he would just, he would do just that. I'll catch you hunting some night. Oh, looking up, in the, I knew he would do just that. I told him to let me up and I would go and not say anything to anyone. Don't let him up, Reuben, Randy said. Beat, beat him or, he'll, or, or hold him and he'll let me do it. Just then I heard growling and a commotion off to one side. The blue hound had finally gotten a fight out of old Dan. Turning my head sideways, I could see them standing on their hind legs, tearing and slashing at each other. The weight of the big hounds pushed old Dan over. I told Reuben let, to let me up so we can stop the fight. He laughed. While my dog is whipping yours, I think I'll just work you over a little. So saying, he, so saying, he jerked my cap off and started whipping me in the face with it. 
I heard Ranny yell, Reuben, you're killing old blue. Reuben, they're killing old blue. Reuben jumped off of me. Ju Reuben jumped up off me. I clambered up and looked over to the fight. Uh, what I saw thrilled me. Faithful little Anne threw. She was, had gone to the assistance of old Dan. I knew my dogs would ver were very close to each other. Everything they did was done as a combination, but I never expected this. It is a very rare occasion for a dog to fight another dog, but she did, but she, but fight she did. I could see little Ann's jaws were glued to the throat of the big hound. She had never loosened that deadly hold until the last breath of life was gone. Old Dan was tearing and slashing at the soft belly. I, I knew the destruction in long, sharp teeth were causing. Again, Ranny yelled, Reuben, they're killing him. They're killing old Blue. Do something quick. Reuben darted over to one side, grabbed my ax from the ground, and said in a loud voice, I'll kill them hounds. Uh, at the thought of what he was going to do with the, with the ax, I screamed and ran for my dogs. Reuben was about 10 feet from them, bent over, running with the ax held out in front of him. I knew I could never get to them in time. I was screaming, no, Reuben, no. I saw the thick stick when it whipped up from the ground as if it were alive. It caught between Reuben's legs. I, let me backtrack. I saw a small stick when it whipped up from the ground as if it were alive. It caught between Reuben's leg. I saw him fall. I ran on by. Reaching the dogfight, I saw a big, the big hound was almost gone. He had long since ceased fighting. His body lay stretched full length on the ground. I grabbed Old Dan's collar, pulled him back. I was different with Little Ann. Cool as I might, she, worked, she wouldn't let go of the hound's throat. Her jaws were locked. I turned Old Dan loose, getting a straddle of Little Ann. I prayed her jaws apart with my hand. Old Dan had darted back in. Grabbing his collar again, I pulled them off, one, uh, off to one side. The blue hound laid where he was. I thought perhaps he was already dead. Then I saw him move a little. Still holding my dogs by the collar, I looked back. I couldn't understand what I saw. Reuben was laying where he had fallen. His back was toward me, and his body was bent in a U shape. Ranny was standing on the other side of him, staring down. I hollered and asked Ranny, what's the matter? He didn't answer. He just stood as though it in a trance, staring down at Reuben. I hollered again. He didn't answer. I didn't know what to do. I could turn my dogs loose. They would go back. They would go for the hound again. I asked, I asked and hollered at Ranny, asking him to come and help me. He neither moved nor answered. I had to do something. So before we read on, all these indicate something's going on. I want you to make a prediction. What is going on where Ranny is not um, answering Billy? What do you think is going on? They're in the middle um, of their dogs fighting. Reuben was on his way with his ax, running towards the dogs. And then all of a sudden he fell. Think about your predictions. What do you think is going to happen next? Uh, looking, around, I, uh, my gl uh, looking around, my glance fell on to old Dan Bob Wire, uh, fell on the old Bob Wire fence. I led my dogs to, uh, to it, holding onto their collars with one hand. I worked the rusty barbed wire, Bob Wire backwards and forward against the staples until it had broke. Running to the end of the under, running the end under the, their collar, I tied them up. They made, the, they made two to three lunges toward the hound, but the wire held. I walked over and stopped at Ranny's side. I asked again, what's the matter? He said, not a word. I could see that Ranny was paralyzed with fright. His mouth and eyes were open wide and his face was as white as chalk. I laid my hand on his shoulder and the touch of my hand, he jumped and screamed, still screaming, he turned and started running. I watched him until he disappeared into the darkness. Looking down at Reuben, I saw what had paralyzed Ranny. When Reuben had stripped, had tripped, when Reuben had tripped, he had fallen on the ax and it entered his stomach. The sharp blade had sunk to the eye of the double bit, uh, bitted ax. 
Turning my back to the horrible sight, I closed my eyes. The muscles in my stomach knotted and jerked. The nauseating sickness spread over my body. I couldn't look at him. I heard Reuben whisper, turning around. I knelt down by his side with my back to the ax. I couldn't understand what he was whispering. Kneeling down closer, I heard and understood in a faint voice he said, take it out of me. I hesitated. Again, he pleaded, please take it out of me. Turning around, I saw his hands were curled around the protruding braid, protruding, protruding braid blade as if he himself had tried to pull it from his stomach. How I did it, I'll never know. Pulling, putting my hands over his and pressing down, I pulled the ax from the wound. The blood gushed. I felt the warm heat as it spread over my hands. Again, the sickness came over me. I stumbled to my feet, stepped back, uh, stepped back a few uh, paces. Seeing the movement from Reuben, I thought it was, uh, he, was, uh, he was going to get up. With my hands, he pushed himself halfway up. His eyes were wide open, staring straight at me. Stopping in his efforts of getting up, still staring at me, his mouth opened as if to say something. Words never came. Words never came. Instead, a large red bubble slowly worked its way out of his mouth and burst. He fell back to the ground. I knew he was dead. Scared, not knowing what to do, I called for Ranny. I got no answer. I called his name and again, again and again. I could not get a reply. My voice echoed in the darkness of the silent night and cold chills ran over my body. I suppose it was a natural, it was, it is natural at a time like that for a boy to think of his mother. I thought of mine. I wanted to get home. Going over to my dogs, I glanced to where the, the blue hound was. He was trying to get up. I was glad he wasn't dead. Picking up my lantern, I thought of my ax. I left it. I didn't care if I had never seen it again, saw it again. Knowing I couldn't turn my dogs loose, I broke off enough of the wire to lead them. As I passed under the branches of the burr oak tree, I looked up into the uh, dark foliage. I could see the bright eyes of the, of the ghost coon. Everything that had happened on this terrible night was, be, uh, was because of his very existence, but it wasn't his fault. I also knew it, he was silent. He was a silent witness of the horrible scene. Behind me laid a still body of a young boy. On my left, a blue tick hound lay torn and bleeding. Even, even after all that had happened, I could feel no hatred for the ghost coon and was not sorry I had let him live. Arriving home, I awakened my mother and father. Starting at my grandfather's mill, I told everything that had happened. I left nothing out. My mother had started crying long before I had uh, completed my story. Papa said nothing, just sat and listened. When I had finished, he, he kept staring down at the floor in a deep thought. I could hear the sobbing of my mother in the silence. I walked over to her. She put her arms around me and said, my poor little boy. Getting to his feet, Papa reached for his coat and hat. Mama asked him where he was going. Well, I have to go, go up there, he said. I'm going, I'm going to get Grandpa, for he is the only man in the country that has authority to move the body. Looking at me, he said, you go across the river and get old man Lori, La Lori, and you may as well go on and tell the Bufords too. Tell them to meet us at your grandfather's place. I hurried, uh, and carried this, that I, I hurried to carry the sad message. The following day was a nasty one. A slow, cold drizzle had set in. Feeling trapped indoors, I prowled from room to room. I couldn't understand why my father hadn't come back from the preacher's. I sat by the window and watched the road. Understanding my feelings, Mama said, Billy, I wouldn't worry. He'll be back before long. It takes time for things like this. I know, I said, but you would think he would have been back by now. Time dragged slowly. By late afternoon, I saw Papa coming. Old, our, mules, our old mules was jogging along. Water was shooting out from under his feet in a small squirt uh, every step. Papa had tied the halter rope around the mule's neck. He was sitting humped over with his hands jammed deep in his pockets of his patches and worn machinals. I felt sorry for him. I was soaking wet, tired, sleepy, hungry. Telling mama, here he is, I grabbed my jumper and cap, ran out to the gate and waited. I was going to ask him what happened at the Pritchards, 
but on, but on seeing his tired face and wet clothes, I said, Papa, you had better go in to the fire. I'll take care of the mule and do the feeding and milking. That, that, that would be fine, he said. After doing the chores, I hurried to the house. I couldn't stay any longer. I had to find out what happened. Walking to the front of the room, I saw my father had changed clothes. He was standing in front of the fire drinking coffee. Boy, the weather's bad, isn't it? He said. I said it was, it was, and asked him about Reuben. He went on to the, he went to the old tree and got Reuben's body, Papa said. We were on our way back to the Pritchards when we met them. They were just this, they were just this side of their place. They were just this side of their place. They had started to look for him. Ranny had been so dazed when he got home, he couldn't make out what he was trying to tell them. But they must have known that no one had something had bad happen. The, they wanted to know what happened. I did my best to explain the accident. It hit old man Pritchard pretty hard. I felt sorry for him. Mama asked how Mrs. Pritchard was taking it. Papa said he didn't know as he never did get to see any of the women folks. He said they were in the furnished bunch he had ever, he had ever seen. He couldn't understand them. They, there wasn't one tear shed that he couldn't see. All of the men had stayed out in the barn. They never had vis they never had been visited in for a cup of coffee or anything. Mama asked when they were to have the funeral. They have their own graveyard right there on their place, Papa said. Old man Pritchard said they would take care of everything and didn't want to bother people. He said it was too far for anyone to come and it was bad weather too. Pa Mama said she couldn't, uh, she couldn't feel uh, sorry Mama said she couldn't help feeling sorry for Mrs. Preacher and wished they had more that they were more friendlier. I asked Papa about Ranny. Papa said, according to what old man Preacher said, Ranny just couldn't seem to get over the shock. They were fighting on taking him into town to see the doctor. In a stern voice, Papa said, Billy, I don't want you fooling around with the preachers anymore. You have plenty of country around here, so you don't have to go there to hunt. I said I wouldn't. I felt bad about the death, the death of Reuben. I don't feel like hunting and, and kept having bad dreams. I couldn't forget the way he looked at me just before he died. I mopped and wandered around in a daze. I wanted to do something but didn't know what it was. I explained my feelings to my mother. She said, Billy, I feel, I feel the same way and would like to do something to help, but I guess there's nothing we can do. There are people like Pritchard all through the, the hills. They live in, a little, in, in little worlds of their own and are alone. They don't like to have outsiders in, interfere. I told my mom I had, I had been thinking about how dangerous it was to carry an ax while hunting, and I had decided I'd, I'd save a few coon hides and get a good gun. Boy, I, boy, I shouldn't have mentioned getting a gun. My mother got, sit, sit, got sitting hen mad. You're not getting a gun, she said. I worry I won't have that at all. I told you long ago you could have had one. You could have one when you're 21 years old, and I just mean that. I'm worried enough with you out there in the hills all hours of the night, running, jumping, but I couldn't stand it if, if I knew you had a gun with you. No, sir, you can forget about a gun. Yes, ma'am, I said in a, in a shook off, and I shook off to my room. Lying on my bed, still trying to figure out what I could do to help, I glanced over to the wall. There, there tied a small bundle was just what I needed. Sometime back, my sisters made a flower, flowers for decoration day. They had given me a small bouquet of flowers. Taking them down, I could see they had faded a little. I looked; They looked rather old, but they were still pretty. I blew the dust off and straightened the crinkled petals, putting them inside my shirt. I left the house. I hadn't gone far when I heard something behind me. It was my dogs. I tried to tell them I wasn't going hunting. I just had a little business to attend to. And if they would go back, I'd take them out that night. I, it, it was no use. They couldn't understand. Circling around... Through the flats, I came to the hollow pave of the Pritchard's place. Down below me, I saw I could see the graveyard and the fresh mount of dirt. As quietly as I could, I started easing myself down to the mountainside. Old Dan loosened the rock. The further it bounced, the louder it got. I slammed up against the, po the post oak tree, and, and it sounded like a shotgun. I held my breath and watched the house. No one came out. I glared at old Dan. He wagged his tail and just to show off, he sat down on his rear and started digging at the flea uh, with his hind leg, at a flea behind, at his hind leg. The way his leg was thumping in the leaves, anyone could have heard it for a mile. 
I waited until he quietly thumped before uh, he quit thumping before it, I started on. Reaching the bottom, I had about 20 yards of, cr of clear crossing, but the grass and bushes were pretty thick. Laying down on my stomach with my heart beating like a trip hammer, I wiggled my way to Reuben's grave. I laid the flowers on the fresh mound of earth and then turned around and scooted for the timber. Just as we reached the mountaintop, my foot slipped and I, and, and I kicked loose a large rock. Down the side of the mountain it rode. This time the blue thick hound heard the noise. He came out from under the, the house bawling. I heard the door slam and Mrs. Preacher came out. She stood looking this way and that way. The hound ran up to the graveyard and started sniffing and bawling. Mrs. Preacher followed him. Seeing the flowers on Reuben's uh, grave, she picked them up and looked at them. She scolded the hound and then looked up at the hillside. I knew she couldn't see me because the timber was too thick and I felt, un un and I felt uncomfortable anyways. Scolding the hound again, she knelt down and arranged the flowers on the grave. Taking one more look at the hillside, she started back. Halfway to the house, I saw her reach down and gather the long, her, uh, gather the long cotton skirt in her hand and dabbed her eyes. I felt much better after paying my respects to Reuben. Everything looked brighter. I didn't, I didn't have the funny feeling anymore. All the way home, my dogs kept running out in front of me. They wouldn't stop, turned around and looked at me. They would stop, turn around, and look at me. I had to smile, for I knew what they wanted. I stopped and petted them and, and them a little and told them as soon as I got home, I had my supper, we would go hunting. And that is the end of chapter 13. And um, I did not expect that to happen. It's a very unfortunate, unfortunate situation that uh, the death of one of the preacher boys had happened. Um, very unfortunate um, accidents like in this situation um, happen often, but um, very unfortunate. Um, but it was in the middle of a lot. So I hope, um, you enjoyed reading chapter 13. It's a sad chapter, um, but it hits a lot of points as well. So tomorrow we are going into chapter 14. Uh, yeah, 14. And um, we'll see what it has in store. Chapter 13 left us with nothing new to worry about, like nothing pending, nothing waiting like chapter 13 did. So I am looking forward to seeing what's going to happen next. Uh, in the story. So tune in tomorrow. Make sure you're answering those questions. It's three questions a day. Very simple. Um, and uh, make sure you get that to me um, by the end of the week. But make sure you're staying up, uh, up to date with the questions so you don't fall behind. All right, guys, I'll see you tomorrow for Where the Red Fern Grows read aloud.